when we discuss the adrenergic drugs, we will not actually pay that much attention to knowing if it's a direct acting or indirect acting drug because there are very limited indirect acting drugs here. Instead, we will find more focus on the types of receptors that we are targeting because that's like the make or break moment, the major way of classifying the adrenergic drugs, both agonists and antagonists. And I thought it's best to start with agonists that target all of these. Are there drugs that do that? Yes, none other than our three catecholamines. I mean, they are the default ligands, right? So they're supposed to trigger alpha and beta effects. They're the like they're like the home guys, right? However, the problem with acknowledging them like that is that we take it for granted, thinking that we can use them interchangeably in practice. Well, sometimes yes, but many times we don't. And why is that? Because as you will see here, the receptor selectivities are not exactly the same for the three. First, dopamine has its own dedicated dopamine receptors, both in the central nervous system and in the peripheral parts of the body. Particularly here, we will be talking about the D1 receptors in the kidney, and it's the most selective one for dopamine. I mean, it's named after it. Then after that, are the beta receptors, particularly more responsive, are the beta-1 receptors, and then alpha, more of the alpha-1. So what is this trying to tell us? Depending on how much dopamine you give a person, the response will either be only activating this, or if the dose becomes a little higher, will now cover this, or if you go even higher, that's the time you target everything. That's why we have what we call as low dose, and then if you target these two, medium dose, and if you target all of them, high dose dopamine. And in fact, they may be used for different reasons. For example, when is low dose preferred? Well, if you use low dose, you only target this receptor. And one of the most prominent results of this is renal vasodilation. The ultimate of the effect of that is increased urine outflow. And that is something that you want for a person who has urine but cannot let it go. For example, kidney failure. For kidney failure, it does not cause kidney failure. It is used for kidney failure to increase urine output. Now, how about a medium dose? What do you get by having this extra receptor? Well, remember, if you do activate the beta-1 receptor, you increase both heart rate and contractility, but in the context of dopamine, it's more of contractility. Or we can also call it positive inotropic effect, just like I mentioned in the previous videos. This can be very useful for heart failure because there are cases of heart failure, especially the more severe stages wherein the heart's contraction is way too weak it will not beat anymore if you don't give an inotropic eventually. How about giving a high dose dopamine? What benefit will this add? Well, if I target alpha-1 receptors and I activate that, I will cause vasoconstriction. And that vasoconstriction will lead to increased blood pressure. And there are cases where patients suffer from excessively low blood pressure. That's actually what we call a shock. So dopamine is actually, the, at least among the three, the most general uh, agent for different types of shock because we recognize it's excessively low blood pressure. And in fact, by targeting both beta-1 and alpha-1, your blood pressure rises. Okay. Now for norepinephrine, its use actually is not that extensive as dopamine and norepinephrine, but it does have a use for a specific type of shock, for septic shock. So in septic shock, of course, it's due to sepsis, bacteria caused, right? Because there are, uh, there are some cases of sepsis. Why does it cause shock? Some of the toxins they release cause the release of different mediators that, long story short, excessively reduce the blood pressure. And look at norepinephrine. It can activate alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors. We're not going to pay so much attention to the beta-2 receptors. So if I activate that, then just like what I said a while ago, that's increasing blood pressure, which can hopefully negate the shock caused by the sepsis. In that case, since norepinephrine is a very powerful uh, uh, substance that increases blood pressure, we can basically use norepinephrine for all other cases wherein, for other cases wherein there is 
really the need to increase the blood pressure because it's way too low. Now, for epinephrine, we ask the question, is the use of this one different from this one? They're almost the same name, in fact. Yes. Why? Because the selectivity for beta receptors of the two are different. Where norepinephrine has equal preference for beta-2 and beta-1, epinephrine actually way, way, way prefers beta-2. So it's like saying, oh, we're not so much going to focus on the heart this time, but more on, particularly for this effect, more on the lungs. So this will cause bronchodilation. And, well, this is the thing that's common with these two. Alpha-1 will cause vasoconstriction. And these are very important because this is what we need for another shock called anaphylactic shock. First of all, we need to know what anaphylaxis is. That's what, well, in layman's term, we can say that's allergy taken to another level. Because when we feel allergies, normally the only manifestation is itching, right? Or some probably have like red eyes because it's also itchy. But in severe cases of those, what actually happens in anaphylaxis is that there's excessive bronchoconstriction. This is also caused by histamine to the point that the patient cannot breathe anymore, gasping for air, that is. And the vasodilation caused by histamine is way too much. We know vasodilation reduces blood pressure. It's way too much. It becomes shock. So that's where we get the word anaphylactic shock. So unlike septic, where the cause is bacteria, here the cause is histamine. And this is why epinephrine is perfect. Vasodilation is canceled by the vasoconstrictive effect here, right? But the bronchoconstriction effect is something in the lungs, right? If it was norepinephrine, it's not so much going to be highlighted. But since in epinephrine, the lungs are much favored because the beta-2 is much favored, the bronchodilation here will be really handy in canceling out that bronchoconstriction, thus a perfect fit.